this initiative has the potential to remove the threat of chemical weapons without the use of force, particularly because Russia is one of Assad's strongest allies. I have therefore asked the leaders of Congress to postpone a vote to authorize the use of force while we pursue this diplomatic path. Welcome to the Journal Editorial Report. I'm Paul Gigo. That was President Obama Tuesday announcing that he would explore a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Syria, mediated by the Russians, before moving ahead with a congressional vote on the use of force. But after weeks of his administration urging military action against the government of Bashar Assad, what does this retreat mean for the president's standing in the world and America's standing? Let's ask Wall Street Journal columnist and deputy editor Dan Washington columnist Kim Strassel and foreign affairs columnist Brett Stevens. So, Dan, you described this this week as the Laurel and Hardy presidency, <laughs> not kind words. So how would you sum up this week? Uh, the Laurel and Hardy presidency. Yeah, uh, beyond yeah. that, I would say it, uh, it has been really a presidency bouncing off the walls. Barack Obama, we just heard him say, has now proposed that if they dispose of uh, Assad's chemical weapons, then we will have that problem behind us. One has to wonder who exactly he consulted on this subject. Chemical weapons are one of the most... He's acting as though these are boxes of books in Assad's library. In fact, it's one of the most complicated substances in defense policy. Policy. And we read the Wall Street Journal has had a wonderful front page story about something called Unit 450 in Syria, a very high, uh, highly sophisticated group in the Syrian army, which is dispersing the chemical weapons to 50 different sites. The idea that we're going to somehow find them and dispose of them is really, as we say, feckless. So w one wonders whether the president is simply acting on ideas as they enter his mind. Well, but the argument from the White House is that this, this was actually brilliant diplomacy. And I'm not making this up. That's what they're saying, because they're saying that now he's got uh, can get rid of the military, the chemical weapons without having to go to war, for example, and uh, and and, uh, and and solve the problem. Yeah, well, that's what the White House would like to think, and its handmaids in the media are certainly pushing that line. In reality, you remember how um, uh, Tony Blair used to be described as uh, Bush's poodle? Well, now the President of the United States is Vladimir Putin's poodle, and he might even be Assad's poodle, because this is going, whatever resolution there is, it will have to be negotiated, and the Russians and Assad will be making demands. You've been seeing Assad say, my demand is that there be no arming of uh, the Syrian rebels and no, uh, no, no intervention. So we're going to get into this bazaar, this sort of Middle Eastern uh, bazaar. B-A-Z-A-A-R. Yeah, well, actually, it's a, this bizarre bazaar, if you will, um, in which the United States will be held hostage to the whims of a tyrant who is gassing his own people and his patron in, in uh, Moscow, who now presumes to write op-eds in the New York Times dictating to the American American president what he may or may not say in well, his speeches. That's, Kim, what, uh, what is so striking. Uh, the day after all of this went down and the president went on national TV to say you know, Vladimir Putin's good offices have now been opened to the United States, Putin runs this op-ed in the United States essentially uh, beating up Obama. I don't think there's any other way to, to describe it. Uh, essentially humiliating American, an American president, taking him to task for saying that uh, he used the phrase American exceptionalism. America's not exceptional exceptional any more than anybody else and saying uh, essentially uh, uh, humiliating him. What, how do you, what do you make of the reaction to all of this in Washington? Well, here's the problem. Uh, you know, we've talked about how Obama was doing all this because he's in a box. He's put himself in a bigger box. I mean, what he did, despite his speech and when she went on national television and made the case for why we might need to still use force against Syria, he has given Congress an exit here. And there is very little chance, if this does not work out with Russia, that Congress is going to take back up a vote and actually vote to, you know, they, they were opposed to doing this anyway. Now they see absolutely no reason to. And having talked to members of Congress, both parties see him as weak. They do not view this as a diplomatic stroke of genius. Um, and, and this could hurt him in other regards, too. But do you think so? There's, what you're saying is that you think there's a little likelihood that uh, the president will, at the end of this, go back to Congress and say, well, the negotiations failed. We need to now act against Syria. 
People were already opposed to giving him that authorization. What he's now done is allowed Congress to run for the exits. And what you are seeing are people talking about, even prior to his speech, even prior to this offer from Putin, people in Congress are talking about, well, maybe what we ought to do is have a vote on legislation, for instance, that uh, requires Assad to, to surrender his chemical weapons in 45 days. There, everyone in Congress is now themselves looking at the diplomatic Options. On this point about, did you mention, Brett, about the bazaar being open? We've already seen Assad saying, look, I, I, I'm not going to agree to give up my chemical weapons mm -hmm. unless you stop arming the Syrian rebels and essentially uh, repudiate any future possibility of the use of force. So this, these negotiations could go on a very long time. And people are taking notice all over the world. I think there's a palpable sensation in Europe, in Asia, particularly in the Middle East, that this administration is weak. This administration can be had, and this administration administration is addicted to its own conceits. You remember that the Carter administration in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan sent F-15s to Saudi Arabia but didn't arm them. That kind of weak signal that deeply troubled our allies in the region. Right. And if you are uh, sitting in Riyadh as a decision maker or in, uh, in Jerusalem as a decision maker, you are looking at American presidency with 40 months uh, Left to, uh, left to go and, and worrying seriously about what will happen next in the absence of any fixed American guarantee. Is there a way the president can retrieve this, uh, Dan? Uh, I mean, do you see it? I, I have to say I've been covering foreign policy and, and, and for a long time. I have never seen a fiasco like this from a U.S. president. I agree. I think the only way he can retrieve it is if he stops running foreign policy out of his own mind and brings in some people to consult with and advise him on a larger strategy. He's got to understand what a mistake this was. But well, this president seems incapable of How would of he it. retrieve it, Brett? Well, um, look, uh, one of the things he can do is simply say, we are going to have a red line. There is a 10-day deadline, and these are these are these are my demands. And if they're not met, I am going to act against Syria, whether Congress likes it, whether Putin likes it, whether Assad likes it. And or, what do you think the chances are? The chances that not? are zero. And you know, <laughs> what makes matter what makes matters worse is there are no adults in the room. You look at you look at President Obama's cabinet. Do you see in Kerry or Chuck Hagel or Martin Dempsey serious people? But look, and I would say in defense of Kerry that he actually wanted to do something. But I think the problem is the president is operating and he can runs this thing himself, and that's why he gets into these mistakes. And that one of the reasons. All right.